come to mind after watching this stuff? All right, watching this stuff. So write down three words that come to mind. It's so sad that people can treat people like that, okay? I think that it's the right thing to do. You think what? And that they think it's the right oh, thing to do. Oh, and they do. think that it's the right thing to do, okay? People came to me with, okay, you're in Texas and it's a small town. Okay, it makes sense. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, um, I mean that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> ABC set this up really good for us, right? At the beginning, at the top of the, the, uh, the intro, it was you know, they're showing cows in the field and they start with the music. So automatically, what are you starting to think? Kick? What? what? Good old boys. Good old boys. What's that? Rednecks and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, it doesn't matter. That is how you were raised. I mean, my parents didn't raise. I have a group of all my parents didn't raise. They didn't treat anybody like that. Yeah. Obviously, their parents or somebody along the line taught them to treat other people like that. So I want, I want to talk about the, the setup, because they set it up for us to, to think about those things and feel those things. Is it possible that those same kinds of things could happen in the Twin Cities? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. All right. I'll take your hand, ma'am, and I saw another hand over here. OK, so a lot of people that agreed with the, with the clerk were kind of stuck in their mindset. OK. That's what I would say to you. are going to say that as well? Yeah. All right. Yes, the passion of the man is not going to be in service. Okay. So you, you really can see his passion. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Well, you mentioned the, the older folks. Um, I wanted somebody to ask the older folks for their parents and grandparents are born. Okay. Yeah. Cool. One, one of the things that, that's so funny about being American is that we all suffer from amnesia. <laughs> and it, it, it's so funny because I hear people having this immigration conversation. You know, Those immigrants and blah blah blah. And I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> Didn't you come from someplace? Yeah. Um, and it, it would have been really interesting if Native Americans would have done a better job of guarding their borders. What, what would have happened, right? Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So what? Are, what are some other things or other things? That thought about it as you were watching that, that clip. The overwhelming number of people that didn't know how to react. Okay. The there's, so, there's, there's not overwhelming, but there's a lot of confusion there. That's what we can do, or what is really right. Or okay. So, uh, for the sake of time, and usually I take you know just two hours on this particular piece alone, I'm going to condense some, some conversations. And, um, and if I start losing folks or I'm going too fast, just stop me and say, can we talk about that for a second? All right. So um, one of the, a metaphor that I'd like to use that came out of the video for me is the fact that they talked about uh, the negative sixes, who were the people who did not want her to have apple strudel. All right. Like, really? Apple strudel? You shouldn't have apple strudel? Um, 
and then the 13 people who stood up for her, and then the 22 who did or said nothing. Now, we, we don't know what people did once they left the store, but we do know what happened while they were there. Right? So there were six people who, who were negative, 13 that were positive, and 22 that did or said nothing. And so typically, what do we call those negative sixes? Or what names do we give those negative sixes? We call them prejudice. What else do we call them? Idiots. We call them idiots. What else do we call them? Ignorant. We call them ignorant. What else? Racist. We call them racist, right? We call them bigots. And once we call them those things, do they say, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Now I'm helpful and I want to be on your side. Is that what happens? No. What typically happens when we call them that? They get defensive, they feel attacked, they get more anger, and they become more entrenched in their stuff. Right? Um, one of the things that the negative sixes forget is that we're all connected. They, they get disconnected from the rest of our reality. Because our reality says that it's, it really is okay for anybody to get apple strudel if they want it. Right? Um, if I had walked up to that guy and I said, you know what, I want you to starve somebody today to the point that they die. What would he have said to me? He'd be like, no, I'm not doing that. That's crazy. Right? Um, however, he, he was at a point that he was willing to deny someone else something that, that he had the right to have. Right? So they get disconnected. Uh, what we know about the negative sixes is, um, and I have to say, I get excited when I meet negative sixes. I, I really enjoy meeting negative sixes, you know, those, those racists or those bigoted or those sexist people. I get excited when I see them. Why? I'm a teacher, right? I know that all human behavior has been learned. And so as a teacher, when I see those folks, I know that there is a chance that I can teach them something different. Right? Are you afraid of being hurt? <laughs> That's what I would be afraid of, is being hurt. We'll talk about fear in just a second. <laughs> we'll, we'll talk about fear in just a second. Um, and so the, the, the negative six is I, I enjoy them because I think that I, I have a story to share with them, that I can, I can teach them something different. Um, over in Moundsview, I've got time for the story. So over in Moundsview, there's a... Um, a um, restaurant bar, and I won't give the name because I don't want to be held, you know, whatever. <coughs> I don't want anybody to sue me or anything. But um, no. but it was uh, so I went over I went over there about ten o'clock on a Saturday. Uh, I was going to get an early lunch because I had a bunch of errands to, to run. So I just thought I'd grab something and, and, and go. So I go into the to the uh, to the restaurant, and one of the things that I noticed is that at the end of the bar, there's a guy who is who had slurred speech, he's got a red face. I mean, he is just drunk off his rock, right? And, um, and so I, I just, you know, give him a cursory glance and just notice him. And so I sit down at the other end, so I'm not disturbing him, right? I sit down at the other end and I, I order my meal. I fold my menu and give it to my server and the guy has moved from the end of the bar right next to me. <laughs> and so I'm like, ah. Now, I'm not afraid of drunk people because I can fight. You know, and get down. Um, but, but drunk people are so unpredictable. You never know what they're going to do. And so, um, you know, we start in with the, the thing that you do in Minnesota, which is just general chit-chat. Right? So we were talking about the weather, right? And, and we we're just, you know, kind of chit chatting. And um, and then he breaks into his thesis of why he moved from the end of the bar next to me. And he looks at me and he says, You know what? I don't like niggers. And I'm like, that's one heck of an introduction. <laughs> what, what what do you say to that? And uh, and so like a good Minnesotan, I try to change the subject, right? <laughs> so I, we started talking about other things, and then something in my spirit said, go back to that. You know, talk to him about that. So I go back to it and I say, well, when you use that word, what are you talking about? 
And he said, um, I'm talking about ignorant, I'm talking about welfare, I'm talking about lazy, you know, and he had all this, all this negative stuff to say. And so I looked over at him and I said, well, do you know any white people who fit those descriptions? And he looks at me and he says, yeah. And so I say, oh, how about those Vikings? You know? So we start talking about sports and, and all this other stuff. And uh, he turns to me and he says, you know what? I don't like niggers, but I like you. <laughs> so now I'm really confused. Like, am I or am I not? You know? And by the way, I'm not giving you license to use this word. I'm only using it for an example in the story. One time I did it, and a guy was like, see, I can say it too. I'm like, no, don't say it. Right? But, um, so, so I said, well, what is it about me that you like? And he said, you know, you have a good head on your shoulders, you're intelligent, you're articulate, you, know, you, you seem like a hard worker, blah, 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 blah. And so I, I turned to him and I said, what if all of the people who you think look just like me, all the people you think look like me, um, that you've met were idiots, and everybody else that you don't know is just like me? And he looks at me and he says, I got to pee. So he gets up and he goes off to the restroom, and, uh, and I'm like, Phew. I have not had to fight, you know, uh, I'm good. Uh, so I get my check, and, uh, and I'm, I'm signing my stuff, and I'm headed out the door, and guess who meets me at the door? Your friend. It's this guy. Right? But he looks a little bit different. He's got, uh, his hair's combed over to the side, he's got water dripping on his face, and he's holding a damp paper towel. And he reaches out to me and he says, I have chickens and we have fresh eggs. If you ever need eggs, give me a call. So I take the paper towel, I go my way, and he goes his way. What did I do for him? I gave him some other things to think about. I may have changed his attitude. I may have broken down a barrier. I may have changed his perception, right? He may have unlearned some old behavior. Now, I didn't take his self worth away from him. Would you have fought me? Would you would you have blamed me if I would have given that dude a piece of my mind? I mean, he called me a dirty, nasty name. Would you would you have said, you know what, Andre? I, I, I understand why you know you gave him the business, right? Would you have understood if I had done that? You wouldn't have understood if I had done that. If somebody had done that to you or called you upside your name, I would understand if you if you told him off. If I told this guy off, would you understand? I would understand. However, if I would have told that guy off, what would that have done for him? I would reinforce everything that he thought about people who he thinks look like me, right? And so sometimes, and, and, and I, you know, this is a kind of a slippery slope or, or thin ice, but sometimes we want to be right so much that we don't do the right thing. Because I, what, what, what I typically hear is people say, well, you know, don't be a doormat. Don't let people walk all over you. Has anyone ever heard somebody say that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and, and I find that comment problematic for this one reason. There's a difference between being a doormat and being a bridge. What, what do you do on a doormat? Or what's the purpose of a doormat? You wipe your feet on a doormat. What are some other uh, adjectives you could use that, that describe, or verbs that you could use that describe what you do on a, on a doormat? Step. You step on it. You step on a doormat. You wipe your feet on a doormat. You can walk on a doormat, right? Can we use those same verbs to describe what we do on a bridge? You can walk on a bridge. You can wipe your feet on a bridge. You can step on a bridge. But what's the difference between a doormat and a bridge? You can go a whole lot further on a bridge. It's getting you somewhere. And a lot of times we get to a, a place where we go, I'm a doormat and people are walking all over me. Oh, that's so horrible. Why? Because it's me, 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 me. 
But sometimes that walking on us, we could be a bridge instead of a doormat. Now, what I'm not asking you to do, I'm not asking you to take punishment from people, I'm not telling you to take disrespect from people, but I am asking you to think about when is it appropriate for you to do the right thing and not necessarily have to be right. I don't know in, in, in terms of building relationships, particularly with, with teenagers, um, there's a lot of stuff because of life experience that I know but if I don't give them the room to know it themselves, I can tell them the information, but it won't mean anything until they had a chance to, to experience it themselves. I could have told that guy, you shouldn't call people that name, but he would not have had a context until when? Remember the child falling down? When does he change his behavior? When he realizes that it no longer works, right? We talk about these negative sixes, and, and we look at the, the video, and we see, we see those the, the, the older people agreeing with this clerk that this woman should not have apple strudel. Why are they? Why are they acting like that? Because they learned it. Even more crucial than than they learned it. Yes, ma'am. Well, let's even back up, even, even back further than that. Simplicity. I mean, the, the, the most simple reason why they act like that. Because it works. We act the way we do now because we look back and we say, in similar situations, when, when I faced this, I acted like this, and I got the benefit that I wanted. And so you can look back in the past and say, in the past, that worked. Which means I'm in a similar situation here, so it should work now, and if it does, I will do it in the future. But what's the problem? It's not working. And so typically what happens with these negative sixes is they go back to these old behaviors and they say, well, it worked this time, and so it should work now, but it's not working. And instead of Figuring that out, what do they do? They go back to this old behavior and they say, I just, I'm not doing it enough. I gotta do it more. So they keep falling down like the kid is falling down and, 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 and acting out until they get to a point where they say what? This isn't working. I need to try something different. And the funny thing is, the dinosaurs aren't here because of this. What could the dinosaurs not figure out? The world is changing, and we can't adapt. So they're not here. And so these negative sixes kind of die off like that. All right, I've spent way too much time on this. Um, I'm going to hit the number sixes. We'll talk a little bit about the, the 22s. Uh, so what 13? So the positive 13s, these are the people that I like. They're my buddies. We're, we're in the struggle together. We can make stuff happen uh, because they have courage. What is the, the precursor or the prerequisite for having courage? What must you have first? Fear. You cannot have courage without being afraid first. And when, when I talk about fear, I talk about it in, in, two, um, in two ways. There is the uh, emotional ambiguity about the future. Fear, right? I don't know what's going to happen if this happens. That, that ambiguity. There's also the fear of respecting your adversary, which means that I, I give my adversary credit for being just as smart and as logical as I am. And so um, what the, the positive 13 say is that I will have that fear at, about the ambiguity. I will also have the fear, the respect for the, the person that I, I am in conflict with and I will do it anyway. Servicemen and women face this all the time. What, what makes a service man or woman you know, put on their uniform and go out there and fight that battle? They have some, some things that allow them to do that. One is that they're connected with, with other people. They're not out there by themselves. Right? The other is that they find allies. So there are people also fighting the battle that they will never even see. 
the, the third thing that allows them to go ahead and fight is that they practice these war drills. So when it comes time to, to, to fight the battle, I'm not surprised when I hear boom, 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 or or there are there are situations and simulations that we've run through that I'm pretty much prepared for. And so the, the 13s go through those those three stages. So they're ready, right? Um, if you look at the 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 uh, the thirteens in the video, the, the man was emotionally upset because he hadn't experienced that, but his son had an emotional connection to what, what this woman's struggle was. Um, and the, the, the young people who stood up, what did you notice when one of them stood up? Somebody else stood up as well, right? So the thirteens. Uh, the twenty twos typically are fearful. <laughs> They're the, the silent majority. Their, their fear, now, this is the interesting thing. Their fear does not necessarily come from the emotional ambiguity of the situation. Where their fear stems from is a lack of simulation. So something pops up, and when I say simulation, what I'm talking about is they haven't practiced this particular thing. And so what typically happens is when, we're, when we haven't thought about a thing, we get stuck and we go, what do I do? What do I do? Go ahead. Karate Kid, yep. either the old one or the new one. I like the new one, it's really cool, right? And so what, what's one of the exercises he asks them? He tells them, take his coat off, he says, put your coat on. Take your coat off and put your coat on. And the kid is getting really frustrated by, by this thing. He's like, why are you asking me to take my coat off and put my coat on? And then what happens? He shows him. So he goes to punch him, and the kid takes his coat off. And then he puts his coat on, right? Takes his coat off. Right? Why? Because he's he's moved beyond this 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 fearfulness, and he's had the simulation to know what to do when those things happen. And I would it, I would venture to say that the, the twenty two don't do it out of malice. They don't do it out of um, uh, out of you know not wanting to help, but they just haven't run themselves through the simulations. They've not thought about it. And it's really interesting. I've talked with my, my male friends, and if I had males in this room, I would ask them this question. As men, how often do we talk about sexism on a regular basis, just with guys? And what do you think the percentage is? Zero. How often do you think women, women, how often do you talk about sexism with other women? At least twice a week here. At least twice a week here, right? So, so that's pretty. That's pretty. That's a that's a that's a huge average, and it's problematic. With if half the problem isn't talking about the solution, right? And so uh, we have to move beyond this. Uh, there's the, the myth of the silent majority in, in Minnesota. Nice. And one of the things that that I want to share with you is that um, it is not okay to be a 22. All right. So I, I sit on that Alexander House board. And when we go to make a decision, we use something called Robert's Rules of Order. All right, anyone familiar with Robert's Rules of Order? Okay. So in Robert's Rules of Order, what the chair does is the chair calls the question, which means we're going to make a decision. And when they call the question, there's a decision to be made. There are four ways in which you can respond to that question. If you agree with what the chair has proposed, what do you say? 
you say I. You say I, yes, I agree. I think that's a great idea. That's what you say. If you don't like what's going on, what do you say? You say nay, no, I don't agree. I, I don't like that. The third thing that you do is you do what? You can abstain, which means I don't want to be a part of this process. Write that down in the minutes. The fourth way that you can communicate your desire is to do what? Say nothing. And when you say nothing, what is understood by the group? That whatever you decide, I'll be a part of it. I will support whatever you decide because I had the chance to say what? Yay. I had the chance to say nay. And I had the chance to say I abstain. I don't want to be a part of this process. So where do you think that the negative sixes get their influence and power to behave the way they do? From the 22 who don't say anything. Because silence we take as consent. All right. Now, yeah. um, I got two minutes. How many good people are here? Raise your hand if you are a good person. You can define that for yourself. All right, a good person. All right. So when I was in high school, I um, we had this practice of always convening in the kitchen. That's where everything happened in the kitchen. And um, and so we would do our homework in the kitchen. We would watch TV in the kitchen, my mom would cook in the kitchen, everything happened in the kitchen. But we'd also prepare for the next day in the kitchen. So there was an ironing board and, and all that kind of stuff in the kitchen. And so one particular night, um, I had set up my clothes for school and we were kind of hanging out, my mom was cooking, and, um, and she cooked catfish. And, um, and it was just delicious, it was crispy, Flaky, you know, it was just, oh, it was delicious. Especially if you put red hot sauce on it. Ooh, it was delicious. So, so we had uh, catfish. And um, so this was a Thursday night. Friday morning in algebra class, I had a huge problem. What do you think my problem was in algebra? I had a different problem, all right? I smelled like catfish, and I will tell you, high schoolers are not kind people. Why did I smell like catfish in my first hour um, algebra class? Because my clothes had been in the kitchen, right? So my clothes were in the kitchen. And they were in close proximity to what? To the grease in the catfish, right? So my clothes smell like catfish. The next day, I went to school and I smelled like catfish. Now, why did I smell like catfish? Because my clothes smell like catfish. And they smell like catfish because they were in close proximity with the catfish. Now, there were other clothes that I had that were in my room, in my closet, that did not smell like catfish. Right? Why did those clothes not smell like catfish? Because they were not in the kitchen close to where the catfish was. Right? I'm, I'm in high school. I don't remember the day. Yeah. And it's so funny because do you think I smelled myself smelling like catfish? No. Right? Because it was something that I was used to. But other people could pick up on what I was used to. Right? So um, so I asked you earlier if you were a good person. And so what I'd like to ask you next is, what do the people around you smell like? Do they smell good like you? One of the things that... One of the things that starts to happen with these negative sixes is that we say that we're good people. And as good people, I can't put up with the foolishness that those negative sixes offer me. I have to cut them off. I can't be a part of it. Uncle Joe tells those bad jokes about those different people. Or, you know, Aunt Glenda is, you know, she's got a problem with the, with the gays. And I just can't be with her any longer. Our kids should not be exposed to that negativity. 
But what happens to Uncle Joe, the negative six, when I cut him off? What's that? Is that exposed to any different viewpoint? He thinks I have the problem. And the funny thing is, we're such social animals that Uncle Joe goes and finds a group that agrees with his foolishness. Right? Water seeks its own level. Right? And so Uncle Joe finds a, another group that, that, that thinks like him, that acts like him, and that group, they start to breed other people who think and act just like them. Right? So, what, so in, in the final seconds that I have, what I would encourage you to do is, with those negative sixes, if you are as good as you think you are, there is something about you that should rub off on those negative sixes. But for it to rub off, where do they have to be in your life? Close to you. And I'm not saying don't take, I'm not saying take disrespect, I'm not saying don't have boundaries, but what I am saying is we can't help these people until we bring them closer to us, until we have contact with them. And so when, when we when we work with, with folks in this building, it's extremely important that we give them the dignity and honor that they deserve, not because they've done something, but just because they are. My name is Andre Cohen. Thank you so much for your time. So lastly, I went about two minutes over. I apologize for that. Um, just want to give you... Um, so these are some cards. They talk about um, cross-cultural communication, um, how we talk with other cultures, and I can give you more information about that at another time. Give me a, a send me an email, and I'll I'll give you more description on that stuff. And then the other one is just uh, the complexity of diversity, and it's not just as simple as being a thing. It is a it's, it's a, a web of things that around our personality. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks. Thank you. Great job. Any questions or comments for me? Where do we have your contact information? Uh, it's right on the on the bottom of the card. You can go right to my website. But, but I want to say, what I, what I want to say, though, is that fear, it, um, uh, rich dad, poor dad, what is that guy's name? Uh, Robert Kiyosaki. Yeah, Kiyosaki, Robert Kiyosaki or yeah. something like that. He, uh, in one of his books, he talks about fear, and he says that fear is false evidence appearing real. The things that we're typically afraid of never happen. In rare instances, they do, and then we, we have to, you know, deal with that stuff. But most of the things that we're afraid of never happen. Um, the, the, the fear of, uh, I don't know, I, someone else said, you know, I, was I afraid of, of being hurt or injured or, or, what, or whatnot? And my consolation comes from knowing that if, if I am hurt or injured, which I typically have relationships with people that don't they don't want to hurt me. Um, they, they typically want to have a conversation with me. Um, but if that were to happen, that's my that that's my call. You know, I talk to people on the street all the time that I don't know. I talk to teenagers that I don't know all the time. But I'm operating from this. I'm operating from this dignity and honor and respect. Um, for example, there was a guy who was uh, he had a dog and he was lifting his dog up by his tail. And the dog was walking on his, on his front paws, and I thought that was animal cruelty. But his asthma said, I said, sir, do you think your dog likes that? And guess what he did? He stopped, right? Um, I, I wasn't confrontive. I, I said, sir, I, I could use the, the, the intonation of my voice to show that, you know, I'm not trying to do anything, but I want you to think about your behavior, right? Um, and I think that the spirit in which we 
and, and interact with folks is so much more important than necessarily the words that we say. There have been situations where I've seen people acting up and I just cough. <coughs> Their behavior changes. That's stuff that I learned as a, as a high school teacher. Um, you know, or sometimes you'll see, you know, people acting, you know, acting up, as my grandmother would say. And sometimes I'll, it'll be as simple as doing something like this. Or punch him in the head. <laughs> um, but, but it's important that we do something. And, um, and to do nothing is not, it's not acceptable because you're giving those negative folks something. If it's writing a letter, you know, how many people love everything they see on television? How many of you have written a letter to tell the station or to tell the, the producers that you don't like that? Right? You yeah. are a rare breed. I don't do it all the time. Right? And you should keep doing it because they will pay attention to that. So, anything else? You understand? Don't let fear grip you. The, the, practice this stuff. Think about it. Talk about it with your friends. You know, what do I do if this happens? Or what do I do if, if that happens? Because guess what? It will happen. And the funny thing is, it will continue to happen until you've learned the lesson. It'll keep happening to you. And so, the, that's my little bit of wisdom. So if there's ever anything I can do for you, you have my contact information on the bottom of the cards. My website is there. Um, I'm AndreCohen.com as well, so it's easy to, to find A-N-D-R-E-K-O-E-N.com. So you can Google me, Facebook me, YouTube me, um, link me, um, tweet me, <laughs> repeat me, you know, all that stuff. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. When's your next session start? Oh, okay. So we're going to take another short break and bring that into the navigation. You did a great job. Tell me, you're the key to our support. Yeah. It's hard to squeeze it all. Yeah. If it wasn't for your love